Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is something I like to do and it's kind of nice with this uh, webinar stuff these days, you can kind of do it uh, from wherever. Um, myself and Alex are gonna be running uh, this sale trim and sale care webinar. And we're probably gonna run it for 45 minutes to about an hour. Uh, we'll hold the questions until the end. So we'll have a little Q and A period um, at the end, but please please maybe write them down or, or throw them in the back if you have any questions and we'll kind of get to them at the end. Um, Alex and myself work at North Sales Vancouver. Um, Alex is, has been a sailor for a very, very long time. He's joined North Sales in the last four or five months. Um, and I've been with North Sales for just over a decade. Um, so we both um, enjoy racing sailboats as well as cruising them. Um, we're very familiar with the Pacific Northwest waters. Uh, we've always enjoyed our stop in Comox in the Round Van Isle. Uh, that's always one of my favorites. Um, and yeah, so let, let's get into this presentation. So one thing in the sale controls and, and sales in general is that there's a lot of different terminology that people use. Um, and I just quickly want to go through a few words that we're going to be using fairly frequently today. Because um, in sale trim, you have sale controls to kind of adjust the shape of your sale. Um, so things that I'm going to go over, you know, we can talk about the loft and, or the boom, topping left, but the sale controls are what I really want to chat about. Um, so a boom vang. So we're going to start with a boom vang. And a boom vang, um, it allows vertical adjustment of the boom. And it is an extremely important tool to shape the main for speed, okay? Tension of the vang basically tightens the leech and flattens the sail as well as bends the mass. And you can see the boom vang in the bottom right uh, corner of that picture. The next stop is the Cunningham. So the Cunningham is a tool that tightens or loosens the loft of the sail. And basically when you tighten or loosen the loft of the sail, and you can also do this with your halyard, it controls the draft fore and aft or the depth of the sail, okay? Uh, and you can see there's usually, as you in the front corner of your sail, usually you have one crinkle and it's probably six inches away from your, from your tack ring. Um, or your bottom bottom front corner. And then also you've got, it's usually below your first reef kringle. So some people are always, what's this little kringle for? Uh, that's for a Cunningham. This, you can use your halyard in the same way as a Cunningham. You can just make smaller fine tune adjustments when you do have a Cunningham and it's not as loaded up as pulling the halyard up, especially as the breeze starts increasing. Uh, next uh, sail control we're gonna chat about is the outhaul, um, and it's used to attach the clue, so the back corner of the mainsail, to the boom. And basically, it tensions or loosens the foot of the sail. And easing it or tightening it would actually make the sail flat, fuller or flat, just similar to the cutting am, just along the foot. And you can actually have more drastic adjustments with an outhaul than you would a cutting ham. Um, and the back sa blast sail control that we have that I'm gonna chat about today is something called a backstay. Um, and a backstay, you can see in this little drawing over the right, there is a topping lift. Basically a backstay is a piece of standing rigging. So, you know, um, standing riggings like uh, shrouds, uh, backstays, forestays um, on a sailing vessel that runs from the top of the mast. Okay, it's usually usually in the aft face of the mast down to the transom, or sometimes you have split backstays and they run to the rear quarter. And basically this backstay adjustment, um, it counteracts the forestay and jib. And it is important sail for tri sail trim because it adjusts so much. Um, and it affects the shape of not just the mainsail, but also affects the shape of the headsail. And we'll kind of go through a little bit more of that. So boom, van, Cunningham, outhaul, backstay. Those are four sail controls that are gonna allow you to adjust the shape of your sail to bring the most performance to your vessel as possible in different conditions. So we're gonna go through all the sails and all the different conditions uh, they usually see on a race course and how you would use these sail controls to adjust your sail shape, okay? So another word I kind of dropped on that first um, slide was the word draft. And um, I guess some of you guys are probably having a couple drafts uh, there tonight and, and a couple slices of pizza, uh, but this is a different type of draft. This is a draft that's on a sail. And uh, basically the easiest way to think of this is um, position the maximum draft, uh, the position of the maximum draft for first location, the deepest part of the sail. So the fattest part of the sail. Um, we measure in percentage of uh, distance along the cord line. So 
usually the chord line would be in kind of almost in theory it's the it's your boom length or the, the straight part of your foot and then as your sail has depth to it um the deepest part of the sail is where the draft is uh new sails and we'll go through this kind of drafts around the middle as sails age the draft gets deeper uh so you get a deeper camber and the draft starts moving aft um and that, that's just something that happens in sales because sales do stretch over over time. Um, so we'll kind of go through all of that. Another little picture here on the left that kind of refers to our boom bang and twist. Twist is something we're going to be chatting about a lot. You can see on the main sail on the left, it kind of looks like a laser sail. Sail's got lots of twists, so the top is open, the boom bang's off, and, and that's a nice open main sail. You can see on the, the right side where you can see the arrow's been pulled down, either the gentleman's or female puts pulled on the main sheet um, and then what or pulled on their boom bang. And what that does is it tightens your leech and it closes it. Uh, so those are two types of twists. The left would be an open um, twisty sail and the right would be a closed sail. And depending on the conditions, you know, either of them can be a correct trim. Uh, I'm going to pass this over to Alex for, for the next slide. Uh, we're both actually in the same room. So we're going to be muting and unmuting ourselves so you guys don't hear us twice. Um, so I'm just going to pass this over to Alex. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today here. And you guys got a nice community of being in Comox a few times during the Van Isle. And uh, thank you for really covering the sail controls pretty well here. So we're going to start with the main sail trim and the light air. And as a Drew was referring, referring a lot to the draft position as the light air, you would want to keep it somewhere between 45-50%. Uh, the, the biggest thing you want to concentrate with in light air is keeping your tail tails flying at least 50% of the time. And uh, referring to the sail controls, like from my point of view, when I'm being a main, main shoot trimmer, I would I like to have a boom van go off, kind of off, uh, out hold, just a nice and flat in the, at the bottom part of the sail because it's still light, but you don't want to keep it too deep because it's going to create a bit of a extra depth in it and it's going to break the flow and no backstay. Uh, the reason for the no backstay is you don't want to have uh, any tension in the forestay as well. As Drew mentioned, the uh, backstay affects a lot the bend of the mast and the uh, sag of the forestay. You want to keep as much power as, sales as, as you can in your sails. And uh, from the main, main trimming, uh, from my perspective, you start in a very light breeze with the traveler all the way up. You're keeping the telltales flying, and your boom can be got to be at the center line or just above it. So you keep top nice and open, telltales are flying, and it's a bit closer on the top, and you powered up as you're going through progression of increasing, uh, increasing the breeze. You start to lower it down the travel and putting more tension on the main sheet. And I think we can go here to the next slide. Um, so as we are going through the increase in wind, we are going to 8 to 15 knots of breeze. Uh, the draft could be in a range of 45% here. And at that stage, we're already starting to put a bit more Cunningham to take the wrinkles out of the sail. Uh, and uh, we still can may not adjust the main pilot too, too much because uh, sometimes, depends on conditions, if you're in very unstable conditions, you do the muscle's job with the Cunningham and a backstay. Uh, and a boom bang, you can just keep it snug, but not too much tension. So you're not closing up the leash of your main sail too much, and you're not bending the bottom of your mast too much. And uh, as the breeze progressing, you can start bringing up out hole in a little bit more. Uh, and I think in those conditions, it's very important to work with the backstay. Uh, that's where it comes into factors that it's affect the band of the mast and the forestay quite a bit. So, and at puffy conditions, let's say puff is coming, your crew is relaying to you, the puff is coming in five or 10 seconds, and you can start to putting the backstay a bit on. So you meet the puff with the tension in your backstay, you pull in some sag out of the forestay, the jib or Juno gets a bit flatter, the main gets a bit flatter, and uh, you may put a bit more main sheet on and you meet the puff with that. As soon as you're going to the lull, you can ease off the backstay a bit, 
is off the main sheet touch and put a traveler up and um essentially your traveler like you what i'm referring to with the in a big picture in a light breeze you start with the traveler all the way up as breeze increasing you start lowering down the traveler and you're putting the more main sheet on and uh, when you reach out to design speed of the boat, essentially when the boat is at a not overpowered, it's perfectly balanced, your traveler is supposed to be at the center line of the boat and it, and it's powered up, you have a nice tension on the main sheet. And when you start to feel the overpowered, you start to pull the traveler back up and putting more twist in the sail again and depowering it. Uh, can you go here to the next slide? Uh, and we're going to the a bit of a heavier area, so like a 15 plus knots. Uh, this is where the draft is going to go a bit more forward. The situation where you start to put more main high alert, you start to put more Cunningham on. Uh, you're pulling the boom vang quite a bit harder. And the reason for putting the boom vang harder because when you're going to start be losing easing your main sheet in the big puff, you don't want to lose the tension on the leech because if you're not going to have any boom bang, you're going to ease off the main sheet and the boom is just going to start flying up and you're going to get so much twist in the twist in the mainsail. The Genoa or jib is still powered up. Your bow is going to start going down uh, and uh, the boat is going to be feeling like you're riding a Bronco somewhere in the woods, essentially, and you're also going to be losing the force stay tension every time you're easing main sheet and if you don't have the boom bang on, it's quite a big uh, big trouble and at this stage depends on the sea state you're bringing more out hole in if it's flat water you can keep out hole in quite tight just to keep it reduce the drag as much as you can if you got a bit of a chop you can keep it a bit eased what's going to give the sail some depth and a uh, backstay uh, comes on quite a bit you start bending the mast you're getting your main sail flatter you're getting more twist up top you're getting four stay tighter again and you're going from there and is a tra in a traveler you can start to if you're sailing in a flat water and you're sailing with a fractional rig you can start dropping the traveler uh, at least i like to do that because with the main sheet you, you, by easing the main sheet you're losing the four state tension in on the frac fractional rigs and uh, that's why in a flat waters in a big race i just like to use a traveler just drop it down a bit and go from there and uh and the wet bank cheating you could do that uh in a big puff when a big puff puff come in and you have someone with a boom bang especially on the race boat you could while you're easing the main you can ask someone to pull the boom bank quite tight which is going to still keep the twist on the mainsail and it's also going to bend the lower part of the mast that's going to start to push the boom in the lower part of the mast into the mat into the mast and it's going to cause a bit more bend in the lower part and the sail is going to get flatter down low. Uh, so I'm done with this slide here, Drew. And I'll, uh, I'll hop on here for a second, Alex. Thank you very much. Yeah, so mainsail trim a lot about twist, guys. So, you know, um, you know, in the, as I said, in the, you know, in lighter airs, you want more twists as the, as the wind starts picking up, you start taking that twist out. And then as uh, the wind starts increasing, you still want to start adding twist by using different sail controls to depower. Now, when you're going downwind and, you know, mainsail trimmers, they're, uh, they're notorious for being really focused upwind, but maybe not so focused downwind, maybe telling the driver where he should go. Uh, but mainsail trim is just as important downwind as it is upwind. Okay, so one thing that I always recommend is let the sail out to the proper angle of apparent wind. Um, a lot of the times in the uh, Pacific Northwest, we normally sail in lighter airs as well as um, as well as very currenty water. So your apparent wind a lot of the time is actually a lot uh, further forward than you would think it would be. So um, you would actually not have the, the mainsail all the way out. So if you're sailing higher angles in lighter air and in, in, in currenty water, you're not going to need your sail all the way out, even though you're in theory going downwind. Um, a lot of the time what I do is like uh, when it out, what, when in doubt, let it out. So, you know, you never want to be choking that sail. You want to be letting it out. And then once you get a bit of a, a, a luffing in the front edge of the sail, that means you probably let it out too far and you can pull it in. Good visual to see. Uh, when jiving, make sure all the batons flip to the proper side. And this is another thing for light air. Um, 
if you've jived and you know your your main sails cleared the backstay, um, sometimes you get caught in the backstay depending on the roach. But once it gets to the new side, a lot of the time, especially in late to medium air, sometimes the battens don't pop to the new side if you do have full size battens. So what you can do is you need to pop those battens. You can pull down the boom, grab the main sheet, shake it a little bit, get the battens, make sure those battens are on the right side on the new jibe. Uh, very important. Uh, ease all sail controls. So when you go downwind, and this is obviously depending on how much you ease them, but you're not going to need the tension and the flatness most of the time that you would at an upwind lake because the your apparent wind's gone down, you know, um, the strength. So you don't need, so you want to power the boat up a little downwind most of the time. And so easing the sail controls, which is your boom vang, your cutting M, your out haul. And then depending on the conditions, you kind of figure out how much you want to be easing those. Uh, a lot of the time when you're heading downwind, especially in like a, a classic boat that, that has a symmetrical uh, spinnaker pole, um, you're going dead downwind. And it's a lot of the time, you know, the boom, late to medium air and different types of sea state and bigger sea state, the boom can kind of fall back into the boat. Um, that kind of disturbs the airflow on your sail. So something you can do is actually hold the boom out. And a lot of boats, you'll see someone kind of either holding the boom out if you're on a 20 to 30 footer, but if you're on a 40 footer, you know, a hand's not just going to hold it. Usually you have someone lean up against it. A lot of the time, the, the most comfortable thing to do is just sit on the boom and look at all the competitors in the background that you're beating. Um, that's always really nice. But what, what happens when you sit on the boom, it's like putting your boom vang on. So that what happens is you're tensioning your leech now. Um, even though you're sitting probably pretty close to the gooseneck, it's it's still going to affect the shape of the sail, especially in lighter medium airs, especially the tension of the leech. So if you are asked to hold the boom out, just make sure you're holding it and not putting any sort of weight on it. Uh, use boom vang to control leech tension. So once you do go downwind, when you're getting, say, if you're going around a mark and your next moves to put a kite up, you really want to let that boom vang off so you can get around that mark, open the mainsail's leech, and depower the boat and get down. Once you get downwind and you get the kite up and you're settled, you usually look up at your top telltale. Same thing Alex was talking about. You want that top telltale flying all the time, but you do want it stalling occasionally. And if it's flying 100% of the time, you'd add a little bit of boom vang. If it's not flying all the time, you'd probably actually ease a bit of boom vang to open up and give that sail a little twist. Now that your main sheet's off, all the twist on the back edge of your main sail is done with your boom vang, okay? Um, Heavy wind, have someone dedicated to the boom bank. So if you are going downwind uh, in a heavy air breeze and the boat starts getting a little unstable, if you end up falling over, getting knocked over, the quickest thing to do to help you re rewrite the boat is to ease that boom bank because that will release the load on the backside of the mainsail and will help the boat stand back up on its feet. Okay, so that's that's mainsail downwind. So mainsail trimmers, they've got a lot to a lot a lot on the go downwind um, as well, even though some of them don't think they do. Um, so now that we've we've kind of gone through mainsail trim and a lot of these same type of concepts translate into the Genoa trim, uh, but they're set up a little bit differently, sheeted a little differently. Uh, so how do you know your jib lead is in the right spot? Okay, um, what you do the first time, every time I get on a boat and I haven't been out there and using their their head sail i'll get the driver to go up onto a close hold course and then i'll get them to pinch up into the wind almost so so much that the whole front edge of the sail will break i don't want them to tack i don't want them to flap it into irons i just want that front edge of the sail to break and i look where the front edge of that genoa or jib breaks and that helps me determine where the car is if the if the sail breaks simultaneously and usually have three sets of ticklers on the sail if the sail breaks simultaneously your car position's in, the good, in a good spot. If the sail breaks in the bottom first, that means you wanna move your car aft. And if the sail breaks in the top first, that means you wanna move the car forward. A lot of the time I'll set up on starboard tack, I'll go, I'll sheet it in, I'll get up to speed, I'll let them to do the bubble test. Say if it's breaking a little low first, I'll actually ask one of my crew members, move the car back on the starboard side. Okay, everyone get ready for attack. Practice attack, get into attack, get on the next tack set up, do the exact same experiment. If now, if it breaks simultaneously, okay, guys, our car's in the right position. Now we can start focusing on other things, preparing for our race day. Uh, on a jib, your draft or halyard tension is usually between 35 and 50%. And that really depends on, you know, sometimes who the driver is on the boat and also the conditions. So the further forward the draft is, the wider groove you're gonna have. Uh, so when you, when would you want a wider groove? Uh, Adds in chop. Okay, so if you have a lot of chop, 
um, you'd want a wider group because you're going to get bounced around. So you're going to want to be able to have a little bit of a driving um, error factor. And also maybe if you have an inexperienced helmet on, on, on board and, and they uh, aren't used to the vessel that they're sailing or these are tougher conditions than they're used to, um, getting that draft forward will give them a little leeway. Uh, when would you want to move the draft out? Uh, you'd want to move the draft aft in ideal conditions, which is what we all want to sail in. Uh, smooth water and medium air um, to give your boat maximum point ability. So if you have a really good helmsman and you have super flat water, you're not getting bounced around, you could move that draft aft. And what that does, it actually it makes the entry really fine, but allows you to point a lot higher. Okay. Something, and then we've got these things as I was talking about telltale. So those those little stickers with yarns on the sail, and they're, they're help that, you know, you need to use those and utilize those because they let you know what's happening on your sails. So, and the big thing, if you are sailing to weather, and most of the time when you are racing, you're either going to weather, you're going downwind, and sometimes you're reaching. But when you're going to weather, um, the lee or telltale should always be flowing out, okay? And if they hang limp, that means the sail is stalling on the back edge, okay? The sail, the trimmer should ease the sheet immediately, okay? So that's one thing. So if you're now, say, if we're just sailing upwind, and but we've already fetched the mark, and it and the, the leeward telltale flags down, you would ease it because you just want to continue going straight. Say if you're not to the weather mark yet, you'd probably ask your, you'd say, you know, we're stalled on the leeward side. You, you, you have ability to head up. We've got a little bit of a lift. So it's identification of a lift. And that little image there on the right-hand side, that's, you know, the, the first one with the red. And basically the further forward the car sheets, um, the sheeting angle pulls on the leech. So you can see in the right picture, sheeting angle is pulling on the leech. So that's car forward. Car aft, you can see the sheeting angle is changing very low and it's pulling along the foot. And then it lets the, lets the leech twist off. So medium air is kind of, you know, right down the middle. So that first one. Light air, you'd have a little bit of, you'd have that car forward and adjusting the leech twist with your jib sheet. And then as the wind starts increasing, you want to move that car back flat in the foot and allow the leech to twist off. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pass this back to Alex here, guys. We've actually separated rooms. So hopefully the echo thing has sorted itself out. Um, so here, Alex, I'm going to pass it back to you. Awesome. And um, just to, to round it up, uh, it's also very important when you sail sail upwind. So, well, you got both sails, you got Juno or Jib and a, and a main. It's very important to keep the twists of the both sails being similar. As long as you can match the twist, you're going to have a great, great flow going through the slot. Essentially, as long as you can match the twist of both sails, your flow between those sails is going to be the best and you're going to achieve the max power, the, the least drag, and you're going to be going pretty fast. So I would uh, put this as a very important part of it. Um, and going to the inholders, uh, it's a great tool. A lot, lots of races around around here use it. Uh, it allows you, inholders they basically allow you to twist off your jab, jab usually as you use on jibs uh, or maybe 110% jibs. It allows you to twist off this jib a bit more and it allows to bring it closer to the center line of the boat so you can point a bit higher. The rule of thumb for the light, uh, light air would be bringing holer in closer to the center line and uh, use a shit tension to get a proper twist. Uh, so usually on the race boats when you know your boat pretty well you can uh, it's a bit of a trick here i'm going to try to explain it it's uh, you can run like a geometry right angle triangle thing and you can set up the marks for let's say 10 degrees of the center line uh 15 degrees of the center line and then for every range of condition you're going to have that mark for the inholer um essentially you start with the inholer quite inboard and then you go through the progression you as you go going to the medium airs you ease off and hold a bit more and in you increase the tension on the jib sheet as the heavy airs when you're like a super super powered you let the in holder go and you're using a lot of shit tension and the biggest thing you got to watch out for the twist in your sail as you're starting to letting in holder 
out, you want to start moving your car a bit more forward. Generally speaking, in hauler in, car forward, sorry, in hauler in, car back, and when you start to ease off, easing off in hauler, car would move forward, which is gonna close off the leech a bit more, and it's going to keep foot a little bit more, more rounder. Um, and uh, another reference point I'm looking at with the in hauler is uh from the main trimmer uh if your main starts to break up top first when you ease it off you're probably too tight on the jib sheet and if your main starts to break bottom first you're probably too tight on the in holder in ideal situation you want to keep the balance between in holder and a jib sheet so when the main, main trimmer lets it out uh, you want to have the break in the main even at the front of the sail. Um, so that would be it on the uh, in-hauler here. Um, Geno and jet frame when tacking. Um, so the tacks are a very important part of uh, any sailboat race. Uh, you can win a lot with that if you're doing it right, and you can lose a lot as well. Uh, with the overlapping genoas, uh, I would suggest to ease the jib sheet a bit earlier in the tack, make sure that nothing collapses, that your genoa is not going to get backwinded. Usually genoa is there in the range 140, 150%, and if something is going to stuck on the winch or you're going to backwind it, it's going to be almost like a brake on a car, so it's going to slow you down quite a bit, so I would suggest to ease it off a bit earlier. with the uh, with the jibs, especially non-overlapping jibs, you can keep it on a bit longer through the tack and ease it off quite quick. The biggest thing you want to avoid in the tacks is a flog in the sail. The less flog is better because it's not going to shake the rig and it's not going to shake the forestay and the less drag you're going to have. Um, when you're coming out of the tack, it's a very important part as a driver, you would want to concentrate on your exit angle. Uh, obviously, we, in, a lighter breeze, in a lighter winds, your exit angle is wider. Uh, as soon as you're going through a progression of increasing breeze, your uh, exit angle is getting narrower and narrower. Um, so um, when you're getting up on a new tack, uh, usually what I refer, especially on the boats, I don't know. Uh, I look at the speed before tack, and when I'm tacking uh, a few times before the race, I'm trying to find out, okay, what is the exit speed out of the tack? Let's say we are sailing um, uh, far 30, and our speed before tack is uh, 6.7 6 knots. We're going in the tack, and we are coming out of the tack as a 5.5. Uh, that's that the reference point is that okay we got a build here and after that I would ask the jib trimmer to keep it a bit open a bit looser and it keep the main a bit open and get back to that six five range and then start dialing in heading up back to the wind and uh, another note is uh, uh, what a lot of people are missing out on is keeping the settings the same side to side is very important, um, uh, especially like the jib leads and the in holders. On the jib leads, uh, usually if you have uh, holes in your tracks, you can count the holes um, and say how many holes is behind the jib, jib lead. Let's say it's uh, five holes behind on one side and you want to match it, just make sure that they're in the same position and it's going to allow you to keep the set, same settings tack to tack in the conditions and uh, repeatable settings would be very important and you can come a long way with that. The same idea with the in-hauler, uh, as I was referring before uh, to, the, uh, to the angle compared to the center line of the boat, you want to make sure that that angle is the same side to side. You can go up to the next slide here, Drew. Uh, nice. Do you want to take it, Drew? Sure, I'll take it. Yep. Uh, so spinnaker trim. So we're going to chat about um, spinnaker trim here for a second. I just quickly wanted to chat about that lead position and just add something. So there is one occasion that you would actually have your one lead further forward than the other. And, you know, you might actually see that in Comox where you kind of guys, you guys get a bit of a swell 
And sometimes the breeze is at a slightly different direction than the swell. So sometimes if you're going upwind, it feels like, as Alex said, you're riding a, bu a, bunking, a bucking bronco in the woods. Um, you uh, basically, you would want that lead a little bit further forward on that tack. And because you would be, you'd be getting through it and you want a little more power in your jib. So a little bit more shape in your foot. And then on the other tack, you're kind of rolling through the swell and you're not kind of bouncing up and down. So that one, you can actually have the lead a bit further aft and the sail flatter. So 90% of the time you want them and you want to start at the same, but if you feel like you're kind of struggling on one tack, you might want to move the lead forward. Or if you feel like you could slide that car back a little bit and get a little bit more point, or sorry, uh, yeah, slide that car back in a little bit more point. You know, that might be an opportunity when the when you're not going directly into the wind and the waves, if, if it's kind of offset. So uh, into spinnaker trim, light air. Uh, we're going to talk about symmetrical and asymmetrical. Um, so symmetrical, uh, pull forward. So a lot of time you're sailing hotter angles. So that means your pull needs to be forward. Um, a lot of the time when I was talking about apparent wind and main sheet trim, and this doesn't always apply, but it's a good start to starter to get there. You kind of want your pole and your main, uh, your boom roughly at the same angle as you're going up and down. So if your pole is really far forward, chances are your main sheet's not all the way out. Um, so you want your pole forward, okay, and you're staying a little bit hotter angles. Clues, so on when I'm talking symmetricals, you know, on an asymmetrical, you have a tack and a clue because the clue always stays attached to the sheets. But uh, on a symmetrical, you have a guy and uh, a sheet and a guy, and it changes depending on where the pole is at. Okay, so clues you want to have roughly at the same height. Okay, if anything, maybe air on the side of the clue being a little bit higher than the tack, and the tack is the one that would have the pole on it. Okay, so pole forward, um, clues roughly same height. Okay, um, asymmetrical and light airs, asymmetricals are very easy to over trim, so they can look very nice. But what you want to do is with an asymmetrical, you're always trying to trim it until that front edge breaks and you can kind of see in that picture of that j111 the front edge of that sail is kind of curling and that indicates that's good but once it starts curling probably more than 10 percent, you want to pull that spinnaker sheet back in and that's what you're constantly doing to make sure that your spinnaker is properly trimmed um you want your tack line so if you do have an asymmetrical you usually have an ability to let the tack in and out from from either your bow or your, or your spinnaker pole and you want that all the way in um as I said, you don't want to oversheet. And also in light air, if you let it out too much and that curl kind of comes through and collapses over 30%, 40% of your sail, it's going to collapse the entire thing. And you almost have to, re it's like restarting the engine again. So you have to almost head up, get the airflow starting again on the sail, and then get the boat moving again. And then once the boat, the parent wind starts moving, you start bearing off and easing again. So, you know, asymmetrical is very easy to use. You just let in and out relative to pole guy, all that stuff. But if you're not really cautious, you can be over trimmed and choking the kite. Or if you're not paying attention and the wind changes or you let the sheet slide through your hands, you can let that sail out. It will collapse and it's, you know, your the wheels are off the bus. Okay. Um, popping into medium uh, spinnaker trim. So, you know, the, I think the above picture, if you guys can see that with a lot of symmetrical boats there, that, I would say that's light air. Um, probably not the best representation, but medium air, you're starting to bring the pole back, okay? Starting to move the pole back. Um, trimmer, and you're gonna start talking about drive, like trimmer wants to talk to the driver boat pressure. So medium air, you know, you're starting to get gusts that are changing uh, the apparent wind speed by two or three knots. In the lighter stuff, you're gonna be sailing higher angles. Heavier stuff, you're going to be sailing deeper angles. That shouldn't be the driver feeling the boat. And some people are very good at that, and especially drivers like to like to know that they know their boat. But the person that has the best feel of that boat right now is the person with the spinnaker sheet in their hand because they can feel how loaded up that kite is. And an asymmetrical kite doesn't need to be that loaded up. So if you have lots of load on that kite, that's an indication that 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 driver can take that into VMG and bear off a little bit. If that kite feels super loose and there's not much tension on it, chances are you need to talk to your driver about going up. So a lot of the time, the tactician's telling you where to go, the driver's driving a course, and then the trimmer is giving you about a five, six degree up and down, depending on the uh, strength of wind that you're currently in. And you, you know, a lot of the time too, you want someone looking backwards. We're talking about tactics now, talking about puffs coming in so you can kind of set up for them and kind of think about how they're gonna you know, change the game and the race course or how you're gonna set up for your new trim. Um, 
make sure it pulls horizontal as possible. So as this wind starts increasing, it goes up. As the breeze starts decreasing, it goes down. For a medium air race, the pit person, the bow person are very important. They're doing a lot of work because what they're doing is trying to make the pull as horizontal as possible because the tip's going to be going up and down, chasing the clues. Okay. Also, the butt end, sometimes, like say a J24 is an upper and a lower ring. Some boats actually have uh, tracks on their mast so you can put the butt of the mast up and down. But basically, as the clues go up, you want the, you want the um, pole to go up. As the clues go down, you want the pole to go down so the clues match themselves. If you have the ability, get that buck going up and down. If you have two choices, you're kind of going, you know, you're using the lower one until that upper one has a better projection. Okay. Asymmetrical. It's getting a little easier on asymmetrical trimmers now. Uh, you're constantly trimming. Dry, you know, it's 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 a lot easier to trim in light air and asymmetrical than it is in, in light air. Uh, trimmer talking about driver boat pressure. So that's very key, especially in medium air. Um, and something you can see over here on this J105, um, you can ease your tack line. And, and, you know, that basically allows the sail to get a longer luff. And it gives the sail a little bit of ability to, to kind of project itself in front of the boat like a symmetrical sail. So you can use this. A lot of the time you can use this in flat water. In choppier water, what happens sometimes, it can get a little unstable, especially if you're over easing it. You know, uh, but you can also use it in a tactical situation. So, if you know, it might not be the best sail trim, but you want to get a little deeper to maybe get mark room on someone, you could ease that tack line a little bit, bear off a little bit. You might lose a little bit of speed, but you're gaining leverage on the boat to the outside of you to make sure you get inside mark rounding. You know, um, so that that's kind of a little trick there. In medium airs, there is chances where you could ease that tack line to try to get yourself a little bit further down, uh, downwind. Okay, and traditionally, that medium air, a symmetrical sail will actually sail a little bit better VMG than an asymmetrical sail, okay? Um, so into the spinnaker trim, heavy air, okay? This is where everyone gets to have a little bit of fun. <laughs> um, symmetrical, you're going to start going pull back, okay? And when that pull starts going back, you know, these clues are going up and up, as I said, as the wind starts increasing. So what you're going to want to make sure you have is a downhaul. And downhaul on tight, okay? So that pit person's getting even more important in heavy air. Um, tweakers on, if you have tweakers, you can put your tweakers on to help flatten the shoulders of the sail and depower it a little bit. Also, um, depending on the size of the boat and depending on the many people you have on the boat, a lot of the time you're, you're kind of trimming the guy and the sheet by yourself as a symmetrical trimmer. You know, you're doing one of these. And um, if, if you have a full crew, you know, you, once you get that heavy air, you want someone designated to the guy someone gets designated to the sheet. You just don't need to be doing both. There's a very high chance of it not working out. If you are a shorthanded so you'd probably want to sheet the guy off. And even some sport boats where they, you know, you're, you're just blasting it, sending it downwind. You'd actually a lot of the time just sheet, lock the guy off. And the one person would be just playing with the, with the sheet. Um, so make sure that someone's designated to the sheet, whether it be a cleat or a sailor on the boat, um, or sorry, to the guy, my apologies to the guy. Asymmetrical, you're going to want to bring that tack line all the way down. This boat's going to start getting loaded up. It's going to start moving quickly, and you don't want the adjustment or the insecurity of a sail that has a tack line up about 12 inches. Uh, be ready to ease the sheet on an asymmetrical. So if you feel like you're about to start uh, going over or starting to get knocked down, you know, we've talked about easing that boom bang and depowering that mainsail. To depower your kite, you just release that spinnaker sheet, and that should release uh, the load on the sail on the boat and the boat should be able to not, you know, you're going to, you're not going to, your rudder's not going to cavitate as quickly. Um, and another thing is there's different types of jibes. There's inside and outside jibes with asymmetricals. Inside jibes is where it runs from the clue, the lazy one, and it runs between the luff and the forestay. So it's inside and then over to the, the uh, windward side of the boat and through the block. And when you jibe, it kind of rubs along the forestay and you invert the sail on the new side. Another one that's very safe for heavy air because sometimes when the forestay is rubbing against the forestay and the sail's inverting through that small space between the forestay and the lob, it can get a little tricky. It can put an hourglass. What you can do is you can run the sheet on the outside around the entire outside of the sail and then down the, down the, the outside of the boat. And that, when you jibe, the sail just basically turns into a flag. Flags around. And then once you get onto the new job, you pull your sheet in and then the sail loads back up and you're off and going again. Um, so I would recommend outside jibes for 
you know, if you're shorthanded, outside jives are probably safe because you're not gonna have a little screw up. It's very easy to do an outside jive, very uh, also easy not to screw one up. Uh, if you got a full crew, you know, an inside jive is okay, depending on how long your pole is. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, run, run outside jives. Uh, if you're in planing conditions, which you can see over here, what you're wanting to do is, is move weight aft in the boat, um, especially a lot with newer boats that can actually, you know, get up on a step and plane. But another thing is once boat starts moving, depending if they're old school or not, having a lot of weight on the bow is just going to dig them into the water forward. You can move that weight back and the boat's going to sit a little better and balance a lot better. Another thing is we talked about this, even when you're going downwind, spinnaker trim, have one crew member with the boom bang in their hand. That will release that load and that leech tension. And that will help you. So if you are feeling overpowered, boom bang off, use that spinnaker sheet, and you probably won't wipe out. Wipe out but I can't promise. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll pass this back to Alex here for, uh, for the next slide. Yeah, and uh, maybe a few few comments just on a say, downwind sail trim there. Uh, also, like a, just a few rule of thumbs for a, 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 a sorry, symmetrical tight. Uh, it's very rewarding to keep your two clues closer together. Essentially, spinnaker is a very big balloon. You want to, if you want to put more power in the sail, you put those clues closer together, start to balloon up top more, and it generates a lot of power. But uh, the bad side of it, what comes with that, especially in the stronger breeze, that boat starts to be unstable. And uh, what, it, what you got to do as a spinnaker trimmer, you try to keep those clues close together. As you start to feel the boat is getting unstable, you want to pull the pole back more and you want to pull more on the, on the sheet. And uh, sometimes you reach out to the situation where a kite starts to go all over the map. And uh, another trick, you can put some lever trigger tension on it and it's gonna stabilize the kite a bit more. Uh, and uh, referring to the asymmetrical spinnakers, uh, the same idea with the jibs and genoas, it's very important to keep the twist between two sails. You want to match the twist of the main sail to the twist of your kite. Uh, and here is a great shot of uh, our Italian friends uh, uh, on Bombarda blasting downwind and a symmetrical kite. Uh, as you can see, the main sail is like a twi it's quite twisted up top, but it's like a pretty close at the bottom. They're matching the twist of both sails. Great. They got a jib out uh, just to generate some more more sail area and the plastic downwind. As Drew was referring, you can move back after, after in the boat just to keep that bow up and not dig in the water. Uh, not, not sure if they're going to be doing a jibe here or not, but... Uh, so uh, in the strong breeze, you have a few options of jibing with uh, with a symmetrical kite. And uh, as Drew was referring, it's an inside jibe and it's outside jibe. Uh, if you're racing the boats, uh, what is high performance, most likely you're always going to be doing inside jibe. And one of the things you can do is called blow through jibe. Uh, it's a, the idea of the blow through jibe, you do it in a very tight racing situation when you want to escape because it's a very quick jibe. And what you do, you're bringing the jib in, you're start jibing, and when you're crossing, crossing the, when the wind is at the center line of the boat and kite starts to back winding, you're still holding the clue, clue down once the crew member is holding it down, and your car, kite starts to fill up from the other side, and you're letting the sheet out and it start bringing the kite in on a new side. Very effective way to jibe if you got dialed in crew. Would not recommend it if you're sailing with people for a few times because it may create some pretty big problems. And a sail trim for the sea state. Um, it's very, I, say, I think it's pretty easy. Uh, in the flat water, you want to keep your sails flat to minimize, minimize the drag in it you don't need any extra power so you can move the move the draft aft a little bit and uh, have a finer entry point on the head, head sail and on the choppy waters you would want to put a bit more depth in the sail you would want to move your jib lead forward uh, jib lead forward you would want to put a bit more twist in the main sail you can 
let your traveler up is of the, of the main sheet and open up the main up top. Uh, what it's going to do uh, with the twist up top, every time you're going to be hitting the wave, your top of the main sail is going to be pumping. And it's what I call like a free, free advantage, essentially. With that twist, every time you're hitting the wave, the top of the sail is start pumping itself and it's generate a bit more, more speed to the boat. And, uh, and another thing you can do the, also refer to the backstay here. Uh, you may you may use more backstay in the flat water and maybe not as much in the choppy water. We're just gonna in the choppy water, as I said, it's very important to keep the power in the sail so you can get through the waves. So you can ease off that backstay a little bit, put a bit of a more sag in the head stay. So again, hitting the wave, it just has that power and a front knuckle to get through. And uh, it also helps to keep the groove for the driver a bit wider. Uh, if driver is not very experienced, it's very important to keep that groove wide. It's more forgiving. And if you're an experienced driver, you can keep the sails in a bit tighter. Uh, the reaching, uh, here we go. This is uh, another part of the sail train, the reaching. And uh, we're going to start with the main sail here. Uh, and, uh, so the big thing, don't keep your sails on the reaching over trim. And uh, it's very important to work with a traveler and a boom vang and a boom vang. You, you would want to match, you would want to keep the main a bit more open up top. When you're gonna start the letting your Genoa out, it's automatically is going to twist off, up top, uh, twist off up top more. So you want to match that twist as well with the main main sail. You may want to lift up your boom vang a bit, a bit. You may want to lift up your traveler a bit higher. Put a bit more, more boom vang just to keep that leech tension going, and keep the situation stable there. Uh, it's also uh, you will if you start saying off wind, you gotta ease off the kind of ham. You gotta ease off the is off your backstay and you got to ease off your out hole here just to put more depth in the sail with the head sails uh depends on what type of your boat boat you have and if you have a outside outside jib track or you may have a just a pad eye on the side of the boat you uh, most of the time you can notice it with the when you start reaching you and you easing the sail off and the bottom of the sail gets pretty pretty around and still feels tight but top of the sail is quite open by having the outboard jib lead or by having the snatch block on the outboard you may make the make the foot a bit more flatter open up the flow on it and uh, control the control the tension of the leech with uh, with the jib sheet uh, with the spinnaker, uh, make sure you're at the proper angle, that you're not too powered up, because it would be very, very easy to wipe out. With the symmetrical kites, I would recommend to put the pole down a bit more, just to keep the uh, windward side of the kite a bit tighter, and the bottom uh, and the leeward side a bit more twist off, essentially make it semi-asymmetric idea, just to keep the tension at the front part of the sail and keep the leeward side uh, a bit more twist off. And uh, with the asymmetric kites, uh, I would suggest to use a lot of curl in the sail. It's, with, it's gonna give a driver more stability to drive uh, and uh, it's going to be more forgiving in case if the puff, big puff is coming in and you're strapped in on the kite, you're probably going to wipe out if your trimmer is not going to ease the sheet quick enough or the person who is responsible for the boom bang is not going to ease enough, you're probably going to be a wipeout. So I suggest you keep attention to those control uh, pretty good. And a uh, code zero, it's, uh, uh, what do we consider to be code zero? Uh, code zero of the sales uh, with the mid girth of the sale of 75% uh, uh, and more. Uh, at the high angle, so, the high angles, your bubble wants to be, uh, and essentially draft wants to be 25% front of the sail. Uh, and loft, uh, loft tension uh, is supposed to be uh, quite tight on those sails just to keep the projection going. Um, the higher, at the higher angles, uh, the leech of the sail is going to start to flog. As you can see with the, 
sometimes sailing the higher angle. So with the code zero, you can hear the slop at the back of the sail. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have jib leads with it. So uh, it's very handy to have a uh, you have to have a tweaker for it. You can get a snatch block and attach it on the lever side with the purchase system, and you put it on the kite, kite sheet or a code zero sheet. And you, as soon as you start to heading up to the wind, and you can hear that flog, you're starting to putting attention on that tweaker. So just avoid that flog and keep the whole sail plan a bit more uh, a bit more stable. And uh, if you don't have it. Uh, you can just uh, adjust the tension by pulling the leech line on. So down with this slide here, Drew. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chat about sail care and repair. So yeah, co co thanks a lot, Alex. So yeah, code zeros are kind of a reaching specialty sale. Um, you know, you can add them, add them to the inventory if you're planning to do a lot of racing around the Pacific Northwest distance racing. Uh, they're really good in lighter airs um, for higher reaching angles. And, and they're usually, especially if you have a small jib, they're a nice overlapping sail that can be kind of used from, you know, 90 to 45 degrees apparent. They can go up above that. They can go a little bit below that as well. Uh, but that's kind of their sweet spot. Uh, pretty specialty sale, but, um, you know, a lot of times if you are racing, they pay for themselves pretty quickly uh, when you have one and the guy right beside you doesn't. <laughs> um, so, and I've been on both sides of that one. Um, so what, you know, sale care and repair. So um, sales are a dynamic product, you know, um, and, you know, we use materials and um, that last a long time. Um, Dacron, very famous. Dacron can last 30 plus years. I would say a sale, a, a cross-cut Dacron sale, which is a very standard sale, would last roughly five years of good shape, five to seven years of decent shape, seven to 10 years of okay shape. And then after about 10 years, that sale is much fuller and a different shape than it traditionally was. It, when the wind hits it, it's gonna, it's gonna get belly out. It's gonna be a little stretchier. And the draft and the camber is gonna be a lot further aft in the sail. And, you know, you can counteract that with some of the knowledge you learned tonight. Like, you know, an older Dacron sail, you'd be pulling on that Cunningham a little bit earlier. You'd be adding a little bit more out all, kind of just stretching it different ways to kind of flatten it out or make it the shape you want. Um, so making sure that you take care of these sails and repair them because they're going to last a long time. Uh, you know, getting a decade out of a sail is pretty good. You could definitely use Dacron sails past 10 years. And I'm sure there's a couple people uh, here tonight that have Dacrons older than 10 years old, and that's completely fine, as long as you continue servicing them, okay? Eventually, just like anything, um, like a car, if you don't put, you know, if you don't get an oil change, your engine is just basically going to seize. Same with a sale. If you just keep using it and using it, and you don't kind of bring it in to get checked over, um, so unfortunately, we can't just put a sticker on your sale, say, come back in 5,000 miles and uh, where we'll do another servicing. It's kind of dependent on use and dependent on sun. So having a sailor or check and getting it checked over, you know, every once in a while, every couple of years, or if you start seeing something happening is pretty important because eventually if the sail ends up failing completely, you're gonna have to replace it when you could have just probably serviced it at a much lower cost. Um, so what breaks down a sail? Usage, okay? so. Just using the sail over time is going to break it down. That's just like anything in this world. Anything that's moving around is slowly going to break down and need some sort of servicing. Okay, UV. UV is the second thing. When we use our sails, they're going to see sunlight. Luckily, we're in the Pacific Northwest. We don't have the same issues as they do down in the Caribbean, but we still, you'd be surprised how much UV um, affects sails. So we have we, we build sails with and without UV covers. When you don't have a UV cover on it, you leave it on your furler, you want to add a UV sock. We have some customers that like to use a UV sock when they're at their own personal dock, but they'll go sailing for weeks on end and um, not use this sock. And I have literally seen in one summer someone ruin, you know, a brand new sail just by spending about a month out in the summer in the Pacific Northwest without using the sock. So you, and then also putting your mainsail cover, even if it's at the end of the day, so keeping the sail, you know, using your sail, don't be worried to use it. If it's a nice sunny day, say, so don't be like, well, Drew said I don't want any UV on my sail, so I'm going to keep the sail cover on it. Go out, use your sails on a nice sunny day. It's the best day to use them, but make sure you cover them up when they're done, okay? 
Um, third one, flogging or fluttering. So that's kind of past usage. And it's kind of involved in usage. Every time you tack, sales are going to flog. But when sales aren't trimmed properly or leech lines aren't pulled or foot lines aren't pulled, sales can flog continuously. And if you have a sale flogging all the time, it's basically going to be breaking down. You're getting you know, one less tack out of it every time it, it kind of shakes. Um, so making sure that your leech lines and foot lines are on that will help the, the fluttering and the flogging, you know, proper sail trim, and just making sure if you hear something like helicoptering uh, and you look up and there's no helicopter, you probably want to check your head sail and your main sail to see what that noise is coming from. And if it's a sail trim thing, or maybe it's a leech line and a foot line. Okay, improper use. So, you know, what breaks down a sail going out with a 150% Genoa in 30 knots of wind? That sail is obviously too large. Using a main sail full hoist in 30 knots of wind. You know, when you might might be in your second reef and just basically not being able to trim it and it just flogging. So improper use, we see that, you know, we see that every now and again. Most people like their sails, so they like to treat them well. Uh, sometimes you get stuck in a situation, that happens. Um, damage does come happen for that. You can't predict, uh, you know, the weather all the time or, or no one can predict the weather. Uh, and sometimes it catches up on you a little too quickly. Uh, but making sure you're using your sails in the proper use is also important. Improper storage methods. So leaving sails on boats year round, Pacific Northwest, very popular thing to do. Is it the best for the sails? No, it's out in the elements. Pacific Northwest is pretty green. Is it going to ruin them if you have proper covering? Probably not. If you have um, if you have a, a laminate sail, you might start getting mildew earlier in the sails life. You know, uh, you might need to clean it once or twice more in the sails life, you know, over that decade. Uh, it's not going to ruin them, but it's definitely not the best for them. But some of the some, some of the worst things that can happen is if you actually take the sails off really wet. And then go store them in a damp basement or something, or or in a in a garage that's going to freeze. Especially if you're using laminates with uh, high modulus fibers in them. You so storage methods. If you are storing your sails, you know you want to make sure you do it on a on a relatively dry day, and then you want to flake them and kind of roll them and put them away nicely. You don't want to just bunch them into a ball, stuff them in the bag, and throw them into a basement really soaking wet. So that kind of helps extend the lifetime of your sail. Chafe. So you can actually see in this picture, there's some stanchion patches. So you can see there's a little bit darker white spots along the foot of that sail. That's a stanchion patch. A lot of the time sails will have stanchion patches, they'll have spreader patches, uh, both on the Genoa and the mainsail. Anywhere where there's something sharp hitting a sail, you want some sort of protective patch, okay? That's pretty important. So if there is a location that doesn't have that protective patch, a lot of the time that chafe will wear through the sail and you'll get a hole. All, it's a very easy thing to do, and, and protective patches are just like big stickers. So you find where it's chafing, you peel the back off the sticker, you lay it down. Usually you do it on both sides. Chances are most boats are symmetrical. Chances are on the other tack, or, or possibly it's going to be hitting it as well. Um, we talked about leech line and foot lines already, but that's basically along the bottom edge of, of the sail and the back edge of the sail, the foot and the leech. There are lines in there, and um, they're usually cleated off near the clue. Some of them are near the tack. Some mainsails have overhead leech lines. A lot of time, the leech is at the clue, which may be hard on some of the bigger boats to reach and get. Um, but when the wind starts increasing, especially with older sails, the corners aren't as stable as they used to be, especially Genoas that don't have battens to support them. So, what, and then you'll see the flapping a lot of the time happen between the battens on mainsails. And what you want to do is you just want to pull that leech or foot line until that flopping or flagging stops. And basically what will happen is there's a leech line or a leech tape along the foot. A lot of the time that leech tape is put on. And if it starts hinging, eventually it will just hinge its way through the sailcloth. And soon you'll it'll start splitting along that edge and it will create a hinge along that edge. So as soon as you hear a little bit of fl fluttering, you want to pull those leech lines on just till it stops. You don't need to crank it. You don't need to, if you really pull it, you'll get a big cup in the back edge of your sail. You don't need that. You just need that fluttering to stop because it's breaking down your sail. And then if you can remember, it's always difficult after a long day of heavy air sailing uh, is to try to ease those off. Once you're, you know, once you're done your race, once you're done sailing, the load's not on the sails anymore that's causing that sail to be a little bit fluttery on the back edge. So you can ease those leech lines and foot lines off. Quick identification, if you go sailing in heavy air, the next time you go out, there's light air and your leeches are kind of curled a little bit or your foot's curled up, chances are you've forgotten your leech or your foot line. It's not the end of the world. 
just load the sails up, ease the leech. Sometimes I'll pull them or oversheat them just to try to pull the leech and pull the uh, foot tight so that the, the lines kind of pull straight through the foot. Um, and then the last one I kind of touched on this is not having them serviced. So any sail uh, I would say needs to be serviced every few years. Uh, Dacron cruising sails, even a lot of our high performance sails are very, very, very durable. But just to get someone's eye on them and checked over every few years, maybe every two years, maybe every four years, depending on how much you're using your sails, maybe every year if you're racing. Uh, but don't wait until you have a major issue because you're going to you're going to spend more money and you're going to lose time of your sailing, uh, more time of your sailing with a major, major damage. But if you're staying on top of it, doing some servicing in the winter when you're not using the boat, you're going to spend less money and you're going to be on the water more often. OK. Uh, I'm going to pass this one off to Alex. Thanks, Drew. And um, I would recommend everyone to have a sail repair kit in their boat. Uh, uh, most of the time, we are planning out our vacations. We are going away for a week, two, maybe a month. And uh, it would be very sudden to come back home if you need to get any sail repair done. or let's say you don't have a loft close enough, uh, like in Comox, if you guys have a, like a small little hole in your sail and the season is uh, full on, you don't want to send, send those sails to us in Vancouver to do the repair and you can just do a, a bit of a repair on your sail yourself and send it to us later in the season. And uh, the items I would recommend to have uh, in your repair kit, it would be a vac thread, some needles, making sure that needles are not rusty. Like a lot of people have a rusty needles would start to break when you're sewing through the sail. Uh, the palm, a palm would be very handy because when you don't have a palm and you got to push through the very thick layer of the material, uh, it can cause a lot of grief to your hands. So would definitely recommend to have a palm, very safe way of doing a repair. And a sticky back repair material and a spinker repair tape those are very handy things to have uh, um, in your tool in your tool bag. Uh, one of the notes for sticky bags: if you are repairing a kite or a genoa with those materials, I would recommend to round up the edges uh, so they don't peel off because the straight straight corners they tend to peel off, and then your patch is coming off. And before you are putting stick, any sticky back on the sail. Uh, I recommend to make sure that it's completely dry. It doesn't have any grease or dirt on it. You can uh, wipe it pretty good. And when you're putting the sticky back on, uh, one of the tricks of the trade is you can grab a rag, or if you don't have a rag, you can use your hand. But make sure that you give a bit of a rub, especially on the corners. It's just gonna help out, help the glue to get a bit warmer on the other side, and uh, it's going to be uh, glued to the sail better. Um, so that's what be my recommendation on it. Yeah, you can carry on to the next slide here, Drew. And uh, here is, a, as Drew was talking a lot of about the UV damage, here is a prime, prime example of uh, what may happen to your sail if you're keeping it on the sun all the time. Um, so we get a lot of sails in the loft sometimes for the repair when they've been out in the sun whole season and you can almost put your hands through the sail. So highly recommend to keep your sails under the cover, making sure that you got a UV stripe on your jib or Genoa or you got a sock if you like or you have a stack pack or a mainsail cover when it's down. Uh, it's definitely going to expand the lifetime of your sale and it may come a long way. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. All right. Well, that was uh, that was our sale trim and sale care repair um, seminar. Um, so we're kind of going to open this up uh, for questions. Hopefully, um, hopefully everyone enjoyed that. Um, so. I guess, are you, do you guys have any questions? Are you guys going to do it through the chat? Or are you guys going to put your volume on? Um, is that, is that something we want to do? Let me just pull up the chat box here. There we go. Does anybody have any questions from that or for us? You know, so we, 
North Sales Vancouver, we are, um, so we sell sales, but we also have a full service loft. Um, so, you know, if you are looking for sale repair or any questions really, and, and anything in, involved in the marine industry, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you know, we've, we put our contact on this webinar, uh, but this is also recorded. So if anyone did miss it tonight, um, it's probably unfortunate because they missed the beer and pizza, uh, but this webinar I'll send out to Rojo and you guys, and you know, maybe you might've forgot a little bit tonight. You wanted to go back and, and review it. We'll send this off to Rojo and he can kind of distribute it uh, through the fleet. Um, so we, we really appreciate you guys coming out. Does anyone have any specific questions? No one's raising their hand, Drew. Pardon? Yeah. Oh. Hey, Drew. How old yeah. were you on that picture at the beginning? Pardon? How old were you on that picture in the beginning? That was that was probably uh, probably my thirties, uh, probably early thirties, early thirties. Yeah. Yeah, and a quick note. Uh, in case uh, if any of you guys would like to reach out to us uh, regarding the sale quotes and you want to get new sales uh, for your season, uh, would recommend to do it sooner than later because delivery dates are start pushing pretty quick here. So if you're looking to getting any new sales in your inventory, feel free to reach out. We would gladly to help you. Yeah, the, the other thing is if you guys are racing under PHRF BC, uh, and you have any questions or you want us to take a look at your PHF certificate, I get almost, uh, like I would say about 75% of PHR certificates I look at have slightly different measurements than the sales that they actually use. And a lot of the time, if you if you measure your sales yourself to double check what's on the certificate, uh, usually you can benefit a little bit and I can work with anybody with that. You send me your PHF certificate and take a few measurements of your sales. We can kind of double check that and see if there's any room or ability for your rating to go to get a little better, aka your boat going s s slower in theory um, or in the rating purpose. Uh, but feel free to reach us, reach out to us about that as well. Sounds good. Last chance for questions in the room. Nope, silent crowd. Thanks very much, uh, Drew. I really appreciate uh, appreciate your time and to Rojo for uh, coordinating. So unless you have any closing remarks, we will uh, sign off again. Yeah, no, that's it. Enjoy your guys' night, and uh, hopefully we'll hear from some of you soon, and and maybe we'll we'll pop up there at some point and, and um, see all you guys on the water. Okay, have a good night, everyone. Thank you for coming.